We'll continue in our reading out of the book of Daniel. And that is, uh, as Nate mentioned, on page 465 of the Pew Bible. And we read, And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested to, of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. This has been a good morning to be together. Thank you for your participation. Last week, our subject matter was historical in nature to develop a fuller understanding of the author here in the book of James and the recipients of his letter. Today is going to be more devotional in nature as we turn the corner and look at James's message. And I hope that you will consider with me what will be my receptivity to what we encounter in God's word? How am I going to receive God's word? Will I modify everything I hear based upon what I've already determined? That's very much what many do. Or will I be open to being shaped and directed by what God through his word teaches me afresh because today if we will if we will allow it today will challenge us you may have noticed that I've randomly been putting my fingers up one two three that refers to uh, if you've missed a, a Sunday or a few that refers to one if you're taking notes what we what we know our mind, two, refers to, to what we feel, what we love, what we, what we desire, our yearnings or our emotions. Three refers to the decisions that we make, what we choose to do, that to which we heed. It's our will. Our mind, emotions, and will together compiling the multifaceted biblical concept of the heart. In Psalm 51, in the midst of his confession and returning to God, King David said of God and said to God, you desire truth in the inward parts. And taking a step further away from legalistic external box checking he goes on and states in verses 16 and 17 for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it but you do not delight in burnt offering the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit not stoically giving the impression that we have it all together a broken and a contrite heart softened toward God. These, O oh God, you will not despise. So engaging not merely the will, but also the emotions in accordance with the knowledge of God, what God has revealed about himself through his word. Perhaps David heard the interaction or heard about the interaction between the prophet Samuel and King Saul, recorded in 1 Samuel 15, where Saul replaced what God said with his own application and then sought to justify his behavior, 
saying he only did it this way in order to give sacrifices to God. But Samuel corrected him, saying, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. So far from polite external giving in, acquiescence, mere performances of the will, and not contrived emotional expulsions independent of truth-based scriptural rich engagement of the mind conforming our lives to the word of God in mind emotion and will together in a loving response of the heart as we've seen in Romans 6 the apostle Paul says of his readers you obeyed from the heart may that be said of us the author, we have learned that the author is James, one of the brothers of Jesus Christ. We saw him last week in Acts 15 as a regarded figure, providing direction to the church in Jerusalem. Being the brother of Jesus and a leader in the church, those points of prominence, those distinctions, we are inclined to highlight and ascribe the honor of celebrity status but for James, and we'll see he has this desire for his readers, that their identity be wrapped up, their identity, their identity, who they are, be wrapped up and defined by their relationship to God. Not content to just be nice, good people, by external estimation, but whether or not a person knows God, a relationship brought about through faith in Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, speaking of Christ, in verse 15 says, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised from now on therefore we regard no one according to the flesh even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh we regard him thus no longer that was James's testimony not trusting his older brother was the savior of the world which Anyone who has a sibling can understand. But he didn't trust his older brother was the savior of the world until after Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. For James, all of this is represented in the opening line of the epistle, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's it. As James addresses his readers, there is no pretension, and I see such tenderness in him. He confronts his readers with truth. He identifies areas of failure. He makes some painful diagnoses but prescribes healing medicine. He writes without condescension, but rather as one of them, a, a fellow sojourner. He writes to a broad audience of fellow believers. In verse 1, he addresses his fellow Jews as the 12 tribes. In verse 2, he calls them my beloved, or my, my brethren, placing them not below him, but alongside himself. He addresses them as my brethren and my beloved brethren, by my count, 13 times in this letter. 
and utilizes this tender address in every chapter, packing five references in the closing chapter alone. The terms we and you are used extensively. We, notice, uh, noting that this is not a finger pointing situation, for we are all in the same boat. James writes in chapter one, when he is tempted, not if he is tempted. He's a realist who speaks to difficult truths. Also in chapter one, each one is tempted. So each experience in life is different, but far from unique. In chapter three, he says, we all stumble in many ways. No man can tame the tongue. So these are universal human experiences that James is very much a part of. Yet he avoids vague generalities by using the more pointed term, you, with the admonition for personal application. We see the recipients to be the 12 tribes. Perhaps this title, I mean, we have to put ourselves in the place of of the reader there. Perhaps this title had become little more than a trite term. A lost distinction, a reference to an earlier time, to a united Israel. When they were distinctly the people of God, but perhaps thinking that no more. I think of the Jews present day and and even throughout history, but I think of them knowing they are the chosen Jacob, but feeling like the cast out Esau, and in general, demonstrating an identity that has the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the distant rear view mirror, and therefore operating as functional atheists. And maybe that's where you are today. James is writing to a complicated history that is distinctly Jewish. As we saw last week in Acts 15, James is a man who knows his history, and he writes with knowledge of where his readers have been. And he writes to them now as God's people in Jesus Christ with instructions for how now shall we live. I think about this continually. Are you not grateful that God operates as a realist? This is where we are. Now what? James does nothing to shy away from his reader's history. So that's tying into history, calling them the 12 tribes. But that's a a sordid history. Uh, A divided kingdom fighting against one another. Idol worship. All sorts of rough stuff. But he doesn't shy away from his reader's history, nor their present reality. How does he describe them? Scattered abroad. What brought about the scattering? This is what we saw last week. A systematic persecution of the church where verbal confrontations escalated often, in many cases, to physical altercations, imprisonments, beatings, stonings which brought about the scattering of the church as persecution drove them out of Jerusalem. Yet the scattering also brought about the expansion of the gospel. As they went through through the area and throughout the whole world with the message of salvation through Jesus Christ, aren't we grateful? Thanks be to God. The way James addresses his readers is a noteworthy distinction. The date of the writing of this letter is also notable. Acts 12 records 
the execution of the Apostle James, the son of Zebedee. And that is dated at 44 AD. And the epistle of James is written as early as within five years of that event, but almost undoubtedly less than 20 years, making it the earliest book of the New Testament. And therefore, these descriptions of persecution are recent. This is not distant history. This calling them scattered, being scattered, is a defining characteristic of the realities facing the early church. And they would be the present tense situation for the readers and a significant influence in the way they would think and operate. If you were in their situation, in their circumstances, might you be inclined to take a step back to try to blend in. Remember, Saul was going into people's homes, dragging people out who were Christians. Might you be inclined to just morph in with what everyone else was doing? To try to not stick out and become a target. You know, go along to get along. Such a situation brings to mind the practice of conquering a people and then displacing them from their land. Placing them in subjection so that they know who's in charge. Entrenching them in the culture of their captors, changing their names, imposing upon them a new language they are to learn, integrating a foreign faith. This is what Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah experienced, displaced from their home, moved to a place where their food, their responsibilities, their training, their freedoms, They had all aspects of life. Everything was prescribed. Their names, their beautiful names, they they spoke of their faith in and spoke of the greatness of the true God. But they were replaced with names that exalted the false gods of the Babylonians. And it's kind of strange to me that we know Daniel by his Hebrew name, not by the name he was given in Babylon, Belteshazzar, but his friends, we know them by their Babylonian renames, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If such a brain wipe were attempted today, I think the tactics would be the same, but the approach would be different. I could imagine each person would be given a device in our technological age. And they'd keep this device with them at all times. Life would essentially happen through this device. It would teach them how to think and how to operate as a person in this land. It would train them what to value, what they should like what is popular, what is acceptable, what is right, what is wrong. It would be the method through which they would be connected to their social group and society as a whole. It would make them a part of things. In a lot of ways, their life would be delivered to them and their life can be lived through this device. It would provide for them everything they need to know. If they have a question, you ask the device and you'll get your answer. It would provide for them their identity. I would think it'd be advisable to make this fun 
and entertaining so the conforming process would even be entered voluntarily and enthusiastically. As we were being changed, we probably would notice, and when it came down to it, we probably may not even care. Essentially being commanded willingly. If you conclude, boy, Davis is sure a Luddite and has a problem with technology, uh, that's not where we're going. But these are deliberate actions to accomplish what overall goal? To strip the people of their identity. To reshape them into something different. For them to associate themselves not with their land, not with their people of origin, not with their God, but to assimilate in the new reality of where they are now and have them forget who they are and where is home. Again, maybe this defines you. I think James is speaking to his fellow believers to remind them of who they are and charging them to operate according to their proper identity in Christ. We see this reoccurring theme among the New Testament writers, and it's precisely what Paul and Peter and I think James seek to counter as they write. Paul says, don't be conformed to the world. Romans 12, 2, don't be conformed to the world in which you live, to the culture in which you reside, the language which you speak but be transformed to who you have been made to be in Christ. Peter pleads, remember who you are. Remember where is your home. 1 Peter 2.11. It may seem like this is where you belong, but you are sojourners and pilgrims. When we look around and we're troubled by what we see and filled about with anxiety and become so wrapped up in the uncertainties of this life that we're tempted to angrily lash out, as is the MO these days, we need to be reminded that this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. We need to remember that we know the one who brings hope, and we need to know and show and tell everyone who has no hope beyond this mess about the God-man, Jesus Christ, who has overcome the world. Peter cautions, it may seem like these worldly desires are available for the taking, but no, they war against your soul. Don't become ensnared by such entrapments. If I become so distracted by temporary things, how are others going to be awakened to the reality of eternity if they don't see that model than me? James calls his readers to remember who you are. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. You may be scattered. You may be dispersed. You may be tempted to think your identity as the people of God as some backseat designation, a distant memory in your history. Well, that was kind of more my parents' thing. It's an identity that's from another time, but no longer. If you are in Christ, remember who you are. Remember whose you are. And James says, let's consider together how to distinctly live as God's people in this world. I think today of communion, remembering is the common theme of the Lord's Supper. Remembering 
Jesus Christ was betrayed, rejected, killed, yes, but he willingly offered up his life for you and for me to pay our sin debt and satisfy the righteous standards of holy God. He died, rose again, and he's coming back. We need to be reminded of these truths, and God knows that, which is why he told us to do so regularly, which is why we have communion every month. Last week, we looked at the book of Acts and the account there of this diaspora, and we saw that this, this diaspora, this, this scattering, was a tremendous opportunity for the spread of the gospel. As our missionary Eldon Porter has rightly pointed out to us, the modern diaspora of people scattering and much of the world coming to the United States is a tremendous opportunity for the gospel, for the spread of the gospel. And in our area, as James acknowledged in Acts 15, God is at work as God's people go with God's message to all parts of the world. Yet there is a great danger for God's people to lose their distinction. There's a great danger for God's people to lose their distinction. Oh, here we go. Here we're, we're getting this isolationist talk. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about forgetting who we are becoming so integrated and so assimilated into our new surroundings that we forget who we are. And James is writing and he's saying, let's not forget who we are. Let's not allow our true identity to be displaced. There's all sorts of problems with it, but here's one of the problems. To become so diluted and lost in the shuffle that we cease to operate as God's people, and that includes that we fail to even carry the message as God's people are scattered. If God's people become like everybody else, then we also become, we don't have anything to say different than everybody else. What did God use to bring his people back to reality? Back to properly, and he's properly refining, purifying, and motivating his church. What did he use? That came about through discomfort. Persecution, first part of Acts. In James chapter 1, you're scattered. Trials and tribulations, God uses that. James chapter 1, verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Understanding the history, all of a sudden, this stark introduction makes sense. Oh, so James isn't a masochist. That's good to know. He just understands where his readers are. And he's speaking to their situation. Yeah, there there was a point to what we covered last week. We're looking at this historical context to understand James and his readers, but also for us. James wrote a letter to this group of people, yes, And God has given his word to us. Also true. This is one of the things that I look at it and say, this is one of the the points that, this is what points to the divine authorship of the word of God. This was written a, a long time ago, and we think it's happening right now because the word of God is living and active. The first thing James comes out of the gate with is, You are scattered. The thought of being persecuted is in your mind. 
Now we can look at this, we can look at their history and find it interesting. We can look at it and be encouraged to see how God used that to further the gospel and to refine the church as we get to see Jesus Christ building his church as he said he would. But I don't know if they were necessarily thinking that's what was going on at the time. Because they were thinking, I don't know, this is just hard. And if you're like me, our excitement and intrigue wanes when James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Because I don't want trials. I don't have an affection for hardship. Yet I am reminded that James is addressing Christians. And I have, I have been very disquieted this week by this thought. Is my mindset toward the difficulties of life any different than an unsaved person? We will look at the situation in the early church and we can reasonably assume that persecution shaped them. Wouldn't you assume that's that's reasonable for good and for bad? Can we also look at the situation in the church today and reasonably assume that ease has likewise shaped us? We're a little less inclined to nod to that. Because I've been quite uncomfortable. I love how James refers to the word of God as a mirror, which allows us to see ourselves. We, we can get pretty comfortable with the history buff end of things. But then right out of the gate, James says, consider it all joy when you fall into various trials. And dear people, uh, we'll... We'll get into this more next week. I, I'll, I'll pause and say that we've cracked this open and we're not going to wrap it up tidily. It's going to be left uncomfortably unresolved. And it'll give us something to consider this week. And Lord willing, connect more of the pieces next week. But it is... It has shaped the way that I think of the work of God. Because when I think of the work of God, when, when I look at something and say, oh, wow, God is really working there. Do you know what I assume? Everything's gravy. It's reshaping the way that I think about prayer. Because when someone's sick and we pray for them, we know that our prayer was answered when? When everything's better. And this has been a boat oar in the face for me. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials and I've had to ask myself, is my mindset toward the realities of the difficulties of life any different than an unsaved person? Will I allow the word of God to say what it actually says rather than me going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep, 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 go to the next verse? But will I contend with, wow, maybe God is working and God is blessing even then. 
as we approach communion, I'll ask the men serving to come forward. And I'll ask you to open up your bulletins. Hopefully you're there taking notes, but let's look at the At Calvary column. Clement of Alexandria says this, Feed us your children as sheep. Master, fill us with righteousness from your own pasture. Instructor, give us food on your holy mountain. The church which towers in the air is about the clouds and touches heaven. And I will be, he says, their shepherd and will be as near to them as clothes to their skin. He wants to save my flesh. How? By enveloping it in the robe of immortality. And he has anointed my body. They shall call me, he says, and I will say, here am I. You heard sooner than I expected, Master. And if they pass over, they shall not slip, says the Lord, for we who are passing over to eternal life will not fall into corruption because he will sustain us. For so he has said and so he has willed. Our instructor is righteously good. I came not, he says, to be ministered unto, but to minister. Therefore, he is introduced in the gospel as wearied. Because he toiled for us and promised to give his life as a ransom for many. For Christ alone is the good shepherd. He is generous and gives us the greatest of all gifts, his own life. He is extremely good and loving to men. While when he might have been Lord, he wished to become a brother to humanity. He was so good that he died for us. And then Isaiah writes, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm so tender and carry them in his bosom so close, so personal, and gently lead those who are young. Frank, would you... Would you thank the Lord for the body of Jesus Christ? Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for sending your son. We thank you that he willingly died on the cross for our sins, that his body was broken for us, because without that, we would not have an opportunity to join you in an eternity that he willingly suffered and died. We thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen.
Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do so together. Jason, would you thank the Lord for the blood of Christ? Heavenly Father, as we remember what Christ did on the cross, Lord, his death, his sacrifice, his blood that was shed, Lord, we are grateful for that rescue plan, for that redemptive measure for humanity, and that through faith in Christ, we are saved. Lord, may we not just remember it today, but that we will remember it every day. We thank you in Jesus' name. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant 
in my blood changes everything. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's do so together. And now we'll sing hymn number 184, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. that the ushers will wait upon you for the benevolence offering and ask that uh, we pray as our Lord taught us to pray here in closing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.